the S&P 500, which carry the S&P 500 to yet another record high. Now, not just a record high for the year, I'm talking about an all-time high, putting us in spitting distance of the 6,000 line. I bought an S&P 5,000 hat while I was in college, and it's about to be at 6,000, so really no flex there whatsoever. What I'm gonna be purchasing next is an S&P 10K hat. What's up, apes? Welcome back to another edition of the Daily Peels Daily Podcast of the day. Thank you all for joining us here once again on this beautiful Wednesday, October 9th, 2024. It is currently 5.59 p.m., so a little bit earlier than usual for us here, but nonetheless, we're just as excited as always to be chopping it up with you guys here at the Daily Peels Daily Podcast of the day. It was an interesting day for markets here. Now, there was the, the big news of the day was the Fed Minutes release. Now, the Fed minutes sometimes matter. Spoiler alert, it did not at all today. It basically, we didn't learn anything at all from it. We kind of got just a little bit more detail, but most of it was information that I would argue has already been priced into equity, so there wasn't much of a reaction there. We did see mostly an uptick throughout most of the session. Now, from the open until about noon, it was nothing but green prints for the S&P 500, which carry the S&P 500 to yet another record high. Now, not just a record high for the year, I'm talking about an all-time high, putting us in spitting distance of the 6,000 line. Now, personally, I felt like an idiot because I bought an S&P 5,000 hat while I was in college, and it's about to be at 6,000, so really no flex there whatsoever. What I'm going to be purchasing next is an S&P 10K hat. Anybody who has a Dow 30K hat or 40K really annoys the shit out of me because... How could you ever possibly care about the Dow Jones? Nonetheless, let's go ahead and talk performance. The WSO Alpha portfolio, our proprietary in-house portfolio, is up 42 basis points for the session here today, a respectable performance. The SP 500 was up 71 basis points, whereas the NASDAQ was up 60 basis points. Small cap Russell 2000 was up 22 basis points. Not that anybody cares, but the Dow did lead the day up 1.03 basis points. So overall, pretty good day. Not really too much to complain about. And this is typically what we expect from the Alpha portfolio. You know, in a big update like this, we're going to underperform a little bit. But we're really banking on our stock selection going forward. If we run one of those attribution analyses, we, which we should be doing pretty soon, we kind of want to come out here and let you guys know exactly how we're managing assets and what's contributing to that return. But I'll have some numbers behind that, hopefully within the next ever. I, I don't really know if we're ever going to have time to do it, but we're going to try our best. Okay. Let's go ahead and get into some of these banana bits for us today. First and foremost, S&P 500 hit yet another all-time high, carried by the, like I said, the Fed minutes, and really, you know, the lack of any other news to be jolting markets out of, you know, markets have an upward bias. If nothing else, they're going to increase over time. So given that there was, you know, basically no other news or anything else like that going on today, of course, that's what happened, and there wasn't anything to hold them back. Meanwhile, uh, the the ongoing robot war occurring at U.S. ports is getting much more intense by the day. Now, the Wall Street Journal dove deep into exactly what is going on there, giving you the story of the people involved and all the different perspectives. And yes, it is just as dumb as you would expect. Trying to fight automation, it's like trying, like we said the other day, it's like trying to fight the night becoming the day by leaving the lights off in your room. It's not going to do anything except delude you into thinking that, you know, you have some kind of sustainable path forward. Absolutely not. All it does is you know, make U.S. exports less competitive by having, you know, a, a higher cost export market because we have to pay laborers instead of robots that don't ask for vacation time, that don't have children that they have to go see, they don't need health insurance, you know, it's a lot easier for them. Okay, election betting, betting is already fucking going off the charts. Kalshi just got this approval the other day, and they are leaning into this hard as hell. The Trump-Harris election debate, uh, there's options based on it as well. Senate races, CFTC complaints, there is so much going on within the betting market, within the political betting market on Calci right now, even though, like I said, they just got that approval. So it's great to see that the American spirit is getting unleashed full throttle on the betting markets. Meanwhile, Tesla's robo-taxi release is scheduled for today at 7 p.m. Eastern time. We'll see if it actually happens, find out what to expect with TechCrunch. Now, this has been one of those things that's been getting hyped up and hyped up, like, nothing else in history for the past decade or so it's been you know oh just wait we're gonna have robo taxi just wait just wait and we're finally at that moment so i'm pretty excited to see what comes out of this i really hope that it turns out just like the cyber truck launch and you know it's cool and everything but there's a massive fuck up that everybody gets to meme on because that would just be hysterical Finally, both sides of the political aisle are horny for tariffs coming into this election cycle. We're seeing both Democrats and Republicans getting big on tariffs. Now, what group of people is very against tariffs? 
Economists, so people who allegedly actually know what they're talking about, every single one of them is saying this is a horrible idea. You could have the economist from fucking Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to the economist from Mike Johnson, like across the full political spectrum here in the United States, they're all saying this is a stupid idea. So that's how you know that we're going to go forward with it, because that's how things work here in the United States. Okay, moving on into our big macro story of the day. I don't even know if this is going to be big, but it's really just the Fed minutes. Now, I agree that important decisions deserve scrutiny. Like, you should take a while to think about where you want to go to college. You should really consider what you want to major in. And obviously, it's a very important decision to, you know, make the call of if you're going to get a, a keg of bush versus a keg of natty for the darty this weekend. Important things like that. They can really determine the outcome of things like your life, society, and, of course, how the darty goes this weekend. All equally important things from my perspective. Now, this is no Bush versus Natty Ice debate or anything like that. I'm Team Bush, by the way, and if anybody wants to fight me on that, I'll send you my address and you can come here. I'm very much Team Bush, but, you know, the debate that we're talking about here today isn't nearly as important. The only debate that was going on was how much to cut interest rates by. So, taking a step back, what are the Fed minutes? Well, the... The Fed minutes, I, I don't know why it's called minutes, actually. That would be a good question. Kind of like the board minutes. But either way, the point of the Fed minutes is to basically summarize the discussion that led to the decision at the last FOMC meeting, which was when they decided to cut interest rates by 50 basis points, bringing them down to the current range of 500 to 525 basis points. So the Fed minutes are kind of, you know, summarizing exactly what led into that decision. Now, like I said, there wasn't really much question going into this over what they were going to do. We all knew that they were going to be cutting rates, but there was question over how much they would be cutting rates. So the economy currently still sitting in this Goldilocks zone. Now, what I mean when I say Goldilocks zone is we're still seeing spending increase. We're seeing wages increase. We are seeing unemployment remain relatively stable, even though it did increase for a couple of months there, started to downtrend a little bit. The only real threats in the U.S. economy that I can find are in manufacturing and in housing. Very important sectors, but if those are the only problems, then you know that we're doing pretty good. So the Fed minutes, they allow us to just dive deep into the sick and twisted minds of these Federal Reserve officials, our economic overlords, and the reasoning behind the monetary policy decisions they make that can either fuck you over or make you the next Warren Buffett. So... What happened? Well, before we get into this, just a quick reminder that the Federal Reserve interest rates over the past decade have been volatile, to say the very least. Now, we came from a zero bound, you know, as far back as 2016 or so, and then we were trying to raise for the three years from 2016 to 2019 to normalize policy coming out of the ZERP era in the post-GFC crisis. So, we were trying to normalize interest rates by bringing them back up. Then COVID happened, so we immediately went right back down to the floor. Then the fastest rate hiking cycle in history when inflation started to tick up again. So it's been extremely volatile, which is interesting because the explicit purpose of the Federal Reserve was to smooth the curve of recessions for us. So there was a lot of panics in the early 1900s. So when the Federal Reserve Act was ratified in 1913, the goal of it was to reduce the ramifications of those panics and of the recessions and depressions that were occurring at that time. Of course, the, you know, in the century period that the Federal Reserve has been in, in existence, it's arguably become a parody of itself and is adding more to this volatility. And we can talk about that another day, but still, that's to give us some background on exactly what's going on here. So once again, the question was, how much are we going to cut interest rates by? Well, this was an interesting meeting because there was one Fed governor who dissented. This is the first Fed governor to dissent from a, from a decision since Thomas Honig back in 2005. Most of the time you'll see Fed presidents dissent, but it's very rare for Fed governors to do so because they might upset the Fed chair and then lose their job. It's, uh, you know, the Fed is a political institution, just like anything in the fucking beautifully gentrified capital city of Washington, D.C. But so the ultimate discussion came down to are we going to cut by 25 basis points or 50 basis points? And really, there was just one big question that was looming, and that is which risk has a higher probability of causing near-term problems to the U.S. economy? Is it inflation going back higher or is it unemployment continuing to rise? So is the risk, is the more pressing risk an upward risk to inflation or a downward risk to employment? So Pretty much everybody agreed that the more pressing risk was a downward risk to uh, employment. Meanwhile, Michelle Bowman, who was a Fed governor, she thought that the more pressing risk was an upward risk to inflation. So she was in favor of a 25 basis point cut while everybody else was for a 50 basis point cut. Her other concern, in addition to re-triggering inflation, was the signal that this would send to markets. The only time the Federal Reserve does 50 basis point cuts is when we're going into a recession. When they know that a recession is on the horizon, they'll do that as kind of to, you know, front run that and start to lower borrowing costs so that we can start to, 
get out of this recession before it even begins. And, you know, everything long and variable legs, monetary policy, so it takes time to work through. So because 50 basis point cuts are usually a signal that there's a recession on the horizon, the signaling and the expectation setting arm of the Federal Reserve was thrown into question here because by cutting by 50 basis points, it's basically them saying, all right, we're pretty fucked and we got to do something really quickly. But j Powell put the kibosh on that real quick. I felt so cool saying put the kibosh on that. Is that a... I don't know, is that like a Jewish saying or something? Either way, it felt really cool for me to say it. So j Powell put the kibosh on that so quickly in his uh, post-game press conference there. They have, obviously, j Powell gets interviewed like fucking Jason Tatum after the after winning the championship after every fucking Federal Reserve meeting. So at this meeting, he just reiterated over and over and over again that this isn't a sign of the of weakness in the U.S. economy. It's just a sign of how confident... The Federal Reserve and the FOMC participants are that we've been able to break the back of inflation. Michelle Bowman disagrees, and once again, that's why she went for a 25 basis point cut. The other factor that nobody's really talking about here is the balance sheet. And, you know, there's good reason that nobody's talking about it because nothing is happening to it whatsoever. All that's going on with the Fed's balance sheet is that they're letting assets continue to run off. Now, taking a step back, the balance sheet presents another way to manage monetary policy. So with the balance sheet, normally what they do is just purchase treasuries and mortgage-backed security assets as a way to add liquidity and then, you know, if they sell them off, remove liquidity from these markets. So it helps to manage interest rates, especially back in the day of a scarce reserve environment that we used to be in prior to the GFC and all the changes that were made after Bazell 3 and all that stuff that came following the GFC. So in this ample reserves environment, it's we've relied much less on open market operations to actually manage interest rates. So effectively, what the balance sheet does is manage liquidity in all of these different markets. And so when the Fed is buying assets, it's adding liquidity to these markets. And when they're selling assets, they're taking away liquidity. If you wanted to loosen policy, you could start buying up assets and that would add liquidity, thus making it a little bit easier. You're basically adding a... You're kind of adding lubricant to the market. You're letting activity flow a little bit more freely because you know the Fed is there to be the buyer of last resort. So what the Fed is doing right now is neither of those things. They're letting assets run off. What that means is when treasuries and MBS mature, they're not buying more to replace them and maintain the size of the balance sheet. They're letting it sink, and this is a normalization of the balance sheet. So very normal process because prior to the pandemic, we were at about a $4 trillion balance sheet with the Fed. After the pandemic, we were over $9 trillion. Now, for reference, before the GFC, we were about $1 trillion, even less than $1 trillion. So this thing has ballooned, so it's part of part of JPAS administration, the goal is to reduce the size of the balance sheet to what it was pre-GFC. They're not going to get that far in his term because I think that ends in early 2026 unless he gets renominated. So that's kind of the current state right now. The Fed could start to buy up MBS or something like that if they wanted to kind of encourage activity in the housing market, but typically that's going to have the effect of increasing housing prices as well. So it's a tough balance right there, but it's certainly something that they can consider. Once again, didn't really learn anything from these Fed minutes, but it's getting us hyped up for the next decision, which is less than a month away on November 7th. In that time, we'll be on the lookout for earnings season that begins today. The CPI print that's going to be coming next week, we'll get the PCE print on Halloween, and then we'll get the October jobs report on the first Friday of November. So stay tuned because it's going to be a lot of fun. With that said, let's go ahead and move into some of these stock movers. So first and foremost, this company really upsets me. You know, I don't know about you guys, but when I don't understand things, I get fucking pissed. And that's probably why I hate these nerds so goddamn much, especially the ones over at Astera Labs. Fuck you guys for making products that are too smart for me to understand. Either way, they came out here today. The stock is up 15.6% because meat riding is at an all-time peak in U.S. equity market. So this company has a close personal relationship with NVIDIA, and they just came out with a new line of products. It's something called uh, Fabric Switches. They specifically launched a portfolio of new Fabric Switches, is what the press release said. Don't know what that means. Allegedly, these uh, help manage AI data flow for computing systems. I assume that means... It kind of directs the data that's like backing like uh, some kind of query for the AI system into some part of the chip that's utilizing the least amount of compute resources, something along those lines, but maybe somebody with a brain can actually explain to me what's going on there. But either way, the reason that they were so hyped is because NVIDIA's senior vice president of GPU engineering came out and said of this announcement that these new switches support NVIDIA accelerated AI infrastructure deployments across a wide variety of AI and HPC workloads. That was the biggest word salad that I have ever said in my fucking entire life, but because it is AI in a sentence, the stock is up 15.6%. Moving on down into a real company that I can understand, we have no 
Norwegian Cruise Line Holdings. Shares are up 10.91% for the session because grandma and grandpa are giving your inheritance to Norwegian Cruise Lines. That's really what we're seeing right here. So if anybody out there is waiting on an inheritance, either go work for Norwegian Cruise Lines because that's the only way that you're actually going to get it or put the kibosh on that. Once again, I'm going to keep saying that for now and I'm going to make that my, my new tagline over here. So anyway, grandma and grandpa are spending all of their money on cruises, and that gets markets pretty fired up. There was a bunch of bullish upgrades on Norwegian Cruise Lines over the past couple of days. Specifically, the one that came today was from City, seeing almost 50% upside with the $30 price target. That's 50% upside from Tuesday's close. Don't check my math on that. Anyway, let's go ahead and move into some of these stinky rotten movers of the day. First and foremost, we have Bear AG. Bear, Bear spelled B-A-Y-E-R. This is the German agrochemical maker that bought... Monsanto, for whatever reason, in 2018, little did they realize they were buying the fucking fucking Harvey Weinstein of agricultural firms. I mean, just a walking lawsuit, and that's effectively what it's been for the past six years since they bought it, and that continued again on Wednesday here. So, the company was down almost 7%, down 6.89%, just one basis point away from a very nice down day. But either way, what happened was a Washington judge said that they were going to review yet another case against the Monsanto unit of Bayer because there are allegations that more Monsanto's products were causing cancer and other harms to their users. So once again, shares down 6.89% as markets don't like lawsuits. Moving on down below, we have Google. You ever heard of it? Google? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Well, um, let me tell you this. The company isn't called Google. It's called Alphabet. I'm sure many of you wise apes are already aware of that. I just didn't really know how to intro this company too well. Alphabet shares down 1.59% for the session here today. You know, I write the daily peel on a Google Doc. I use Google Search for most of the research to do so. Most of you read the daily peel in your Google inbox. So I can't imagine why the DOJ would think that Google is a monopoly. It's an absolute mystery to me, but nonetheless, they still do. And yesterday, the Department of Justice came out with at least some of their ideas for how to remedy Google's antitrust violations. And it turns out they are seriously considering a breakup of Alphabet. Now, we've talked about this before, what a breakup would look like. I have no idea what I'm talking about, so it's pure speculation out there. You could separate, you know, like the search business from the... Like you take you take traditional Google search on one side, you take YouTube and spin it out other words. You take, you know, maybe either AdSense or AdWords and spin that out as their own business. You take other bats and make it a VC firm. You can do all these different kinds of things because there are so many businesses within the Google empire. So it makes sense why they're kind of looking at this. It would be the first government mandated breakup of a company since AT&T in 1982. The breakup of AT&T, by the way, formed companies include, well, it was called uh, Bell Networks at the time. And they were very famous for the Bell Labs unit of the company. One of the most innovative research labs of the 20th, 20th century, maybe the most innovative by a lot of people's measures. Either way, the breakup of Ma Bell, it formed companies like AT&T, Verizon, SBC Communications, uh, Lumen Technologies, all these different ones were ultimately born out of the Ma Bell breakup and then subsequent acquisitions that followed from 1982 until like the mid-2000s. But the other outlet Alphabet has taken recently was in their lawsuit against Epic Games, which requires Android platforms to allow other app stores to compete with Google's Play Store. So once again, shares down 1.59% on the day. Finally, our last story of the day, we are talking about the state of the states once again. This is one of our favorite things to talk about. But this time, we're not focused on migration. We're going to be talking about the budget handling skills of these states. We know that Uncle Sam is the absolute worst at it. I mean, Uncle Sam is $36 trillion in debt, and he just racked up another $1.8 trillion dollars of debt in the last year so this guy has absolutely no idea what he's doing when it comes to his money maybe he should trust his nieces and nephews a little bit more because states are killing it now that's a very broad statement most states before i get into this i should probably say most states have a balanced budget requirement within their state constitution so it's basically saying like hey we have to have a balanced budget at least in any given time period. Some are, you know, annual, some are, you know, over a decade long period, we have to have a balanced budget. It varies exactly how it's done, so it makes sense. The United States absolutely should have one of these, as Warren Buffett very famously said. He can fix the deficit in a single day. You know, if you say, uh, with the policy that he proposed was anytime the deficit runs more than 3% of GDP, no sitting member of Congress is eligible for re-election. And that's 
one of the best ideas that I have quite honestly ever heard of, at least when it comes to, you know, fixing the U.S. budget deficit, but states absolutely haven't figured it out. So in the last fiscal year that they studied, according to Pew Research, only two states ran deficits in fiscal year 2022. Now, in the last, uh, this was part of a 15-year period study from 2008 until 2022. In that time period, over that 15 years, only six states ran deficits. These are Connecticut, Hawaii, Illinois, my home state of Massachusetts, baby, New Jersey, and New York. Now, these are all ones that ran deficits. The worst one was Jersey, down at 93.9% of expenses, whereas New York was close to being to breaking even at 99.7% of expenses collected in revenue. But on the other side, you have states out here like Utah that are flexing a 136% budget surplus throughout that period. Utah also flexing the lowest average age in the country at 31.9 years old. Meanwhile, Kentucky, Florida, Texas, New Mexico, and Montana follow very closely behind. Montana was the only state in that 15-year period to never run a fiscal deficit. So, you know, it's interesting to see all of these, like the factors that lead into, you know, good state management versus bad state management. Obviously, there's a lot that goes into these budget deficits and surpluses. It's much more than just taxation. For example, state like California in 2022, they ran by far the largest budget surplus in the entire country. They had a $97.5 billion surplus in 2022, but that year they also carried $275 billion worth of unfunded pension liabilities. Both of those are the largest in the nation. So really what it comes down to when we're talking about good financial management from these states, there's a couple of factors. I think the, the big six factors that you need to have in order to, you know, consistently run a budget surplus would be high access to natural resources. Like we see in states like Texas and Montana, low or no income tax because it encourages business formation in these states and you can you know tax through other manners like on I, I don't know why we don't tax on securities backed loans first and foremost but that's a story for another day low and no income tax in states like florida and alaska high quality infrastructure utah and georgia do a great job with this very diversified economies like we see in washington and north carolina high foreign direct investment like we see in south carolina and delaware and finally balanced budget constitutional requirements which we actually see in every single state except vermont but the most strong ones are in states like wyoming and west virginia so the big takeaway here is that uncle sam could learn a lot from these states but more importantly Uncle Sam could rely on these states a little bit more. There's a big problem of scale when it comes to a lot of these social services. You know, a lot of people don't like to pay into social services that they feel aren't necessarily going towards anything that's actually beneficial for society. And that's a lot harder to do when you're talking about a pool of 340 million people. But if a state like Wyoming in their, you know, 600,000, 700,000 residents, there's a much higher degree of trust among those people, those Wyomingites over, you know, their connection to other Americans in places like Los Angeles or New York City. So, if we were to kind of take some of these, you know, social payments that the federal government makes, specifically like one that comes to mind pretty easily is Medicare and Medicaid, and reallocate them to the states, we could start to think about this stuff a lot differently. So first and foremost, Uncle Sam spent $1.6 trillion on Medicare and Medicaid in fiscal year 2024. That means if you were to reallocate this expense to the states, that reduces the deficit by 90% right there in just that one move. Now, obviously, it's very challenging to move this stuff to states, and states already have some involvement in the public health care system that we have in the United States. But if we were to say, we're not doing this at the federal level anymore, reallocate the budget for a given year to the states, and then let the states do it from then on, you could, over a decade-long period or so, you could really improve the fiscal situation of the United States by just getting rid of that expense. We're going to have to do something like that anyway because interest costs are going to eat up all of the other expenses. So I think the way to do it is to rethink scale in social services and kind of reprioritize municipalities and states as the primary government uh, the primary government involved in the lives of citizens. You get the higher degree of trust. You also get more people that are kind of more willing to commit to stuff when they can actually see how it's working on a state-by-state -state level. So it reminds me of the Nassim Taleb quote where he said, with my family, I'm a communist. With my close friends, I'm a socialist. At the state level of politics, I'm a Democrat. At a higher level, I'm a Republican. And at the federal level, I'm a Libertarian. Presumably at the global level, he's an anarchist. So it's an interesting way to think about this stuff and the reliance of, of, of a high degree of social trust on, you know, well-working social safety systems. But that about does it for us here today. We are going to end on a wonderful quote with national debt in mind. Mr. Ho Herbert Hoover, one of the worst presidents the United States has ever had. He said, blessed are the young for they shall inherit the national debt. And then this guy went ahead and created the conditions required for the 1929 stock market crash. So shout out to Herbert Hoover. Hope you're fucking rotting in hell. You know, I'm sure he was a nice guy. Actually, I, I don't know why I said that. But either way, I don't want to get a shoot his after me. So let's go ahead and just call it like it is or call it there for the day. 
Happy investing, happy trading, Abe. Thank you all for joining us once again. Shoot me an email if you have anything interesting to say, david at wallstreetoasis.com, and I'll talk about it on here tomorrow. Like I said, happy investing, happy trading, and bye now.